Let's talk a little bit about eating less because again, people who listen to this podcast are very familiar with the way I think about this, but I'll, I'll just sort of explain it to you very, very quickly. Um, I sort of break it down into three strategies to go about eating less. So strategy one is a very deliberate strategy called caloric restriction. So it's, it's the only way that you directly go about eating less, which is, you know, clearly what bodybuilders do where they're tracking every macronutrient, every calorie, they are counting them and they are uh, shrinking that volume of calories lower and lower and lower to reach an energy imbalance that is sufficient for the amount of fat loss that they're trying to produce. Again, you could argue that this is the most flexible way to go about weight loss because it is agnostic to when you eat or what the actual constitutive you know, elements are of the, of the diet. Um, it's really just paying attention to the energy balance or imbalance. The second way that you can go about doing this is indirectly through dietary restriction, right? So you just, you talked about a vegan diet. Hey, you're taking a lot of things out of the diet um, and many of them are energy dense. So there's a very good chance you're going to lose weight just on the basis of the restriction. Similarly with a ketogenic diet or something of that nature, you're going to really generally eat a lot less. And it's that uh, effect of the diet on perhaps your appetite and food choices that's going to result in lower energy intake and therefore energy imbalance. The third technique also indirect is time restriction, uh, which people call intermittent fasting. Here you're going to make a larger and larger window of non-eating and by extension, a smaller and smaller window of eating that eventually results in a caloric deficit. Now, we have historically, meaning in our practice, cautioned people about excessive use of time restriction if people fit a certain demographic. And that is, you are obviously overnourished, which is our way of describing you have excess adiposity, you have high visceral fat, all of these things, you're metabolically unhealthy, so you're overnourished. We need to make you less nourished. But if you're also under-muscled, I get very worried about excessive time restriction because with calorie restriction comes protein restriction, and with protein restriction comes not just a reduction in mass, which on some level is the goal, but a disproportionate loss of lean mass. And so I want to pause there. Does this resonate with you, the, all of these the, the, the sort of trade-offs? Yeah, yes. I mean, uh, no, I fully, fully agree on that. The, the third one is, of course, the time-restricted uh, feeding or intermittent fasting. Um, it works for people, but it doesn't work in a scientific setting because now there's a lot of studies coming out. We've also done a study in that, 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 uh, in, in that, that area. So if you um, standardize the nutrition, so the caloric content of the diet, you actually see exactly the same uh, fat loss or weight loss with the intermittent or the time-restricted feeding versus the same feeding, but then X percent of less caloric intake doesn't make any difference. Yeah, However, so, so let's just make I, sure, but, but let's just make sure people understand what you just said. And I want to make sure I understand what you just said. You're saying that if you normalize for calories across the course of the day versus in a shrunk window, if it's the same number of calories, there's no weight loss. Exactly. Yeah. There's okay. no not less weight loss. So if you have 25% energy restriction independent of the time frame, you're going to lose the same, the same, the same, yep. the same amount of, yep. of body mass or fat mass. Now, for me, uh, intermittent feeding or time restricted feeding works because I go to the university, spend most of my day here, um, have no time to eat, running uh, back and forth, and then I come home. I sit behind a computer doing all my emails and revisions of manuscripts, and I start eating way too much and also crap food. So I think more than seventy percent of my food intake, energy intake, is between seven or eight and twelve o'clock at night. Mm. If I do time restricted feeding from say ten to six, I will lose weight because I wouldn't have time to eat that amount of calories in that time frame. And that's good for a lot of people because they actually change their homeostasis, and for a few weeks they lose a lot of uh, lose a lot of fat mass, and then they start eating differently, and then they gain weight again. So sometimes it's easy to change your routine and your bad nutritional nutritional habits, but it, the the time of feeding is not a metabolic effect to lose more weight. Yeah. So 
what we like to do to try to get around the effect of people losing too much lean mass, and again, I find this to be particularly important in women who want to lose weight using a time-restricted feeding approach, but who, you know, frankly already have an ALMI or an FFMI that's in the bottom 20%, uh, just for folks listening, these are two different ways that we measure and quantify lean mass on people. So this is people that are coming in with, they're under muscled as we describe them. Um, we will say, look, if you want to eat between, you know, 2 p.m. and 7 p.m., that's your feeding window. You have a five hour window to eat. So you're 19 hours of not eating, five hours of eating. We find that women can't, and again, I say this because it is mostly women that experience this, but I think it could be true for anybody. It's very difficult to consume your total amount of protein if we're trying to get you to 1.6 or 1.8 grams per kilogram in a five hour period. Furthermore, you have that 19 hour window where you're missing one of the major inputs to muscle protein synthesis. So a workaround is, hey, during that period of time, you're gonna have two shakes that are virtually no calories, but are gonna give you 50 grams of protein. A 25, you know, you're gonna have a 25 gram whey protein uh, shake, you know, again, just mixed with water at eight o'clock in the morning, and again at 11 o'clock in the morning, and then at two o'clock, you're gonna eat a meal, and at seven o'clock, you're gonna eat a meal. So you're gonna get your total amount of protein, and yeah, you've sort of cheated on your time-restricted feeding because you've had 200 calories outside of it, but let's be honest, the purpose of this is caloric restriction. That 200 is relatively small compared to what you would have consumed throughout the day. So again, long question, I apologize, but it's as much for the listener as it is for you. Would you take that approach as a better way to tackle two simultaneous goals, lose fat mass, preserve or gain lean mass simultaneously? That would be the main goal, and I would completely agree, but I, I, I miss one factor, and I, I'm 100% uh, sure that you actually added the effect. Of course, the training mention. effect, yes. The yeah. resistance training. Yes. So if you, if you, even if you have, I mean, old studies show that if you have a caloric restriction, you lose you lose fat free mass you lose muscle mass but if you do one uh, two twice a week a resistance training session even in a caloric deficit you don't lose muscle mass so you can prevent the muscle mass with simply two sessions of resistance type exercise a week preferably more but of course that's that's the minimal yeah so besides that protein it's the exercise that makes you respond way more to the same or less amount of protein that you ingest and in the scenario I described where you're going to have that person have a protein shake at eight o'clock in the morning and, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning and then eat two meals between say two and seven, um, it's probably not that important where the training session goes within that day at this point. I mean, I think for many people, it's just convenient to do exercise in the morning. Um, and, and I agree, of course, that that's, you know, that's half the battle is you have to have the training stimulus to produce the effect. Yeah. I mean, that's what people always ask us, like, should we ingest the protein immediately after or an hour after exercise? Does it make a difference? No, not really, because every meal following your training session will have a greater response. And so also after, before the next session, there will, again, three meals or four meals. So it's a continuous, consistent effect of training to make you respond better to the same amount of protein. And also in the hospital, this is essential. Simply feeding people more protein because they're deficient and losing muscle is not the only solution. Actually, if you make them uh, a little bit more active between meals, every meal has more effect. If we do a little bit of exercise, more of the meal will actually be converted to muscle. So using that intrinsic label protein, I always have three uh, different uh, settings in my lectures. The first one is, this intrinsically protein shows you beyond any uh, discussion, you are what you eat. In fact, you are what you just ate. Now, funny enough, if you eat that same protein after you've done a little exercise, more of that protein is converted to muscle. So if you're physically active, you are more of what you just ate. Now, every athlete is using this and every coach knows this, but we hardly use it in medical care. And so it gets worse because then you come to the third part of the, of the of a lecture 
where I show you that with physical inactivity, you become anabolically resistant. So if you become physically less active, you are less of what you just ate. Now, the problem is when you become sick or ill or you get surgery, you have two issues. You exercise less or you become less physically active, but you also eat less. So it's a double whammy downwards. And that's what makes us so susceptible and, and, and vulnerable uh, to a short period of inactivity or sickness.